Such a mystery. Such a mystery. The mysteries of God are so awesome. You know, the Lord is just asking us to seek. Seek, you will find. Amen? One of the things that we can never stop doing is quit. We can never quit. If you drill for oil, eventually you'll hit it. It's the person that stops that somebody comes out and drills the same hole and hits it. See, if you're pressing in for something, it's amazing how, how many hours people will stand in a line to cash a check. <laughs> or fight if they've been cheated on their check. Boy, did they raise all kinds of stuff. But to press and to touch the heart of God, that's where the flesh says, no. But the Spirit says, you got to go, man. You got to get in there. Because see, until you touch his heart is when your heart gets touched. When you touch his presence, his presence touches you. Well, it's amazing how we'll fight for dope money, and all the other stuff out there that is self-destructive. But to fight for life, humans aren't accustomed to that. To fight for the life giver. Because in his presence is life giving. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Everything is in his presence. Healing, deliverance, freedom, joy. Amen. Prosperity. Everything. And that's what humans lack. There's a difference between human lights and eternal lights. <clears throat> See, when you are born again, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, touched, changed by the presence of God, you are eternal. We are an eternal light. But you and I were human. We are humanites. We were lost, deceived, living outside of salvation's truth, playing a form of religion in hope that we would make it home because somebody said so, <laughs> but never really knowing yourself. I've asked many people, so do you think you're going to heaven now? Yeah, I think so. I'm a good person. That's a bummer to think so and not know so. That means there's no relationship. See, only in his presence can you have relationship. But you must fight to get to his presence. He loves it. He loves to see us fight to get to his presence. See, he fought to get into our presence. He paid the price on the cross. He came as a man stricken, rejected, cursed, hated, misunderstood. See, he came already and paid the price to come into our presence, but he had to put on our presence <laughs> called flesh so he could communicate. Then he crucified our presence, his flesh on the cross, and released his presence. Does everybody understand that? And his presence is still flowing to those who are willing to step in. It's like going by a river. You can look at it all day long. That's a nice river. There must be some fishies in there. Maybe I'll go fishing. Why not go in and go get them? The river looks so refreshing and wonderful, but yet people just stand at the banks and look at it. People come out of the river and they tell, them, tell those people about it. Man, you should come in. It's beautiful. I'm not ready. I don't think I'm ready for this yet. 
If God brought you to the bank of that river, it's got nothing about you getting ready. It's about you getting pushed in the river. If we were waiting to get ready, none of us would make it. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21. I'm going to talk about a special covenant tonight. It's a covenant between the bride and the bridegroom. Which comes together as marriage. There is a mystery of the marriage. In verse 21, would you read it with me? And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, obviously this was going to be a tremendous thing for Adam because he was alone. He walked with God. In fact, God brought him the animals and Adam named them. And the Lord said, you know, I want you to have another helper. He would have probably kicked and screamed, so the Lord had to knock him out. He put him to sleep. So the Lord did surgery on Adam. And he brought the woman to the man. In verse 23. And Adam said, this is now the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That is a female. If anyone doesn't know that. <laughs> and they shall become one flesh. That is called marriage. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Again, one flesh is sanctified by God. Mirror, it's called marriage. It is a marriage covenant. It is between a man and a woman, not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman. That is not acknowledged by God Almighty. What's the purpose of it? To produce offspring. Amen? It was initiated by God, purpose to be a lifetime covenant. This marriage is based on a covenant of God as a lifetime. It is holy. It is sanctified. And it is just. Marriage. Now, we see that everything that God does in the physical realm is associated with is, hap is a spiritual. Those are called parables. So we see that God creates man in his image and likeness. From him comes the bride, a woman. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> Didn't know it was going to upset someone so much. <laughs> and it was the same thing when Jesus hung on the cross. On the same side that the rib was taken from Adam was where Jesus was pierced. And from that side, he birthed his church. Which would be known as his bride. Remember, Adam was, Adam was uh, the man of the flesh. Jesus was the man of the spirit. So we see that there is a parallel here. And in this marriage, so what he was going to do, he was going to make a covenant, 
a lifetime covenant. Now, can that covenant be broke? Yes. So we see here that God had established this right from the beginning as a parallel between the things in the spirit and the things in the natural. Because God had chosen to create man in his image and likeness and bring a covenant, but at some time bring a marriage, a spiritual marriage, a mystery. In Matthew 22. First principle of spiritual happiness is to make sure you marry the right person. Hello. You want to be miserable? Marry the wrong one. Rule number one. <laughs> marry the right person. Matthew 22. Is everybody there? In verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a what? Marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. How many times have we been invited to Christ and refused? He was inviting us to a wedding. Verse 4. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited. See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the what? Wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and did what? killed him. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. This is associated with the things that are getting ready to happen. When the wrath of God comes on the earth, he will destroy many cities. In fact, a third of mankind will be killed. Verse 9. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. The wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Believe me, many individuals will try to come up another way, but no man comes to the Father except for through the Son. Buddha. Mohammed. Allah. Those are all the ones that will carry... Dress in the wrong garments. The Pope won't go up that way either. Verse 12. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There he will be, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are what? Called. That means invited. Many are invited, but few are chosen. So God has been sending the invitation out for multiple years ever since. In fact, the greatest invitation was Jesus came. He carried a personal invitation for every single human. Many will reject Many will accept. In 1 Corinthians 7. In verse 1. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Hello? 
Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Again, male, female. Adam didn't, I mean, God didn't create Adam and Steve, right? It's Adam and Eve. Amen? Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. Likewise, also the wife to her husband. Now, in this, I want you to begin to look in the arena of the spiritual. Jesus being the bridegroom and us being the bride. Affection. That's relationship, isn't it? The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men would even, were even as myself. Now Paul was not married. Amen? But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than them to burn with passion in hell. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. You notice, willing to live. So there must be a choice. In other words, a person has a free will choice. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? In verse 32. Is everybody there? But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, and how he may please his wife. In other words, when marriage is established, there's still the area of pleasing God and pleasing your spouse, isn't there? Amen? But God is always first. I always hear the thing, well, you know, God first, family second, and fellowship third. Let me tell you the three. God, God, and God. If God is first of everything, everything else falls into place. You will do the right thing if the Lord is first. See, one of the first things that has to happen as a believer, we need to get married to the Lord and stay married. When you're married to the Lord, man, everything. Why? Because he gave his life for you and you give your life for him. That's the same thing in marriage. There's an exchange of life. The problem is everybody wants to have Jesus, but nobody wants to marry him. Oh, they only want the benefits. Oh, I accept Jesus, yes, just for the benefits. Now, Lord, please send me this. Lord, please send me that. No, that's not how it is. He first wants... Us. You. You. He first wants us. This is the marriage right here. When the other marriage comes into place, that's a blessing. But if you proclaim to be a believer and you're not sold out to him, the enemy will have access to your marriage.
Hallelujah. Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter six. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. Do not be what? Unevenly yoked with unbelievers. Listen, don't marry someone because of their potential. And don't marry someone thinking you're going to get them saved. That's unevenly yoked. And if you're spirit filled and they're not, that's unevenly yoked. Does everybody get it? There's always a conflict. There's a conflict of doctrine. Well, I just don't believe that. I'm going to tell you, you have problems. Now, of course, if you're already married, you better work it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do not be unevenly yoked with unbelievers. It's amazing how many people wrong, marry the wrong person. But I'll tell you, if you're married with Jesus, you're not going to marry the wrong person. And in fact, you'll know what person to marry. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion is light with darkness? And what accord is Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them, walk among them. I will be their God, and they'll be my people if they do this. If they do what? Come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. And don't touch what's unclean. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So again, do not be unevenly yoked. We're to come out from among them. Just because the world does things doesn't mean that we do the same thing. Amen? We are different from the world. Go to Proverbs 12. Marriage is a covenant. Proverbs 12. And verse 4. Would you read it with me? An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. But she... Who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. In other words, that crown becomes thorns. Has everybody got it? An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. But she who causes shame is like rottenness in the bones. That's why you better marry the right person. Amen? Now, things can happen down the road. But there's that, what, look at, the reason why things happen down the road is because lost marriage. Why? Because you're giving your life to him. You're exchanged. You see, when people take back their life, they break covenant. When they go out and commit things and touch unclean things and whatever, they're actually breaking covenant. So the one who was exchanged, the life giver, hello, who is Christ, you break covenant in him, you're no longer, you're, on, you're, you're decaying now, you're no longer in life. And, and, and things begin to happen because what happens, you know, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, doesn't he? Again, one thing we do not want to break is covenant with the Lord because we're to be married to him. He's married. He wants us. Amen. Is everybody okay? Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah.
Uh, chapter 13, I'm sorry. Nehemiah chapter 13. Verse uh, twenty-three. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? You know, one of the things the Bible says is be anxious for nothing, but all things in prayer and supplication. That's why it's really important that if your marriage between you and the Lord must be solid. If you and the mar you, your marriage between you and the Lord is solid, then when it's time to get married... You won't allow anything to interfere with your marriage, with you and the Lord. Because that's covenant. That's a love affair. And see, then you'll be filled with God's love to love your spouse instead of the love of the world, which is nothing but lust. Then there's no jealousy. Does everybody understand? There is no jealousy. There is no fear. Oh, what are they doing? <laughs> In marriage, it's a whole different thing if it's, if it's covenant. Do you understand that in that area that when your relationship is with the Lord and you're married with the Lord and there's a solid relationship with the Lord, there isn't fear, there's not anxiety, there's not stress about your spouse. There's complete trust. In fact, the Bible says you've got to work out your own salvation. In other words, even if your spouse does whatever, you shouldn't be moved. Because you're married. Or else you're not married. If you're moved because of your spouse, then you have no marriage with the Lord. It's superficial. It's fake. But when there's a true marriage with the Lord, you're not moved. Does everybody understand that? It's solid. You don't have to hunt for a spouse. God will send you one. And he won't send you one that has six legs and, you know, it's way out there. You know, you can't tell the book by the cover, you know. Amen? You're to know them by the fruit. You know, in the kingdom of God, it's different. You know, one of the things that God does with, with us is he woos us. It says he draws us. Then he begins to actually court us. And, he, and we don't even know we're courting him at some... We just know that there's something happening. See, when I, when I came out of detox, God was drawing me already. I knew, I didn't know. Man, I came home and there was a girl living in my house. I said, you got to go, and I don't know why. <laughs> you got to go. This ain't right. Don't ask me why it's not right. I took that 12 step, and I began to pray it. I wasn't doing the 12 step and stuff. I just used that as a prayer. And, and God was taking what I was praying and began to woo me. And I began to, as I began to tell the truth and be honest, I began to have a peace. I thought, wow, I kind of like this. And as I began to do it more, I began to go, yeah, I really like this. I I'm being loose from my torment. So when I came home, I saw torment. <laughs> this ain't right. You got to go. She couldn't understand. I couldn't understand. I just knew it was the right thing to do. Because the Lord started wooing me. He started courting me. Until I finally accepted him to marry him. Does everybody understand that? And now there's a marriage and a covenant. He gave me his life and I gave him mine. 
That's marriage. And it's wonderful. Hallelujah. Where are we at? Number, uh, verse 23. In those days I saw Jews who had married women out of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Verse 24. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. So I contended with them. This is Nehemiah. And cursed them, struck them, struck some of them, and pulled out their hair. Man, he was mad. <laughs> And made them swear to God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. Why? Because they were unevenly yoked. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet in, among many nations there was no king like him who was Beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to what? To sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil transgressing against our God by marrying a pagan woman? You know, there's a lot of women out there, that, or men, that proclaim to be believers, but they practice witchcraft. That's paganism. Does everybody understand that? It's paganism. And one of the sons of Joadiah, the son of Eshlobahab, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sambalat, the Horonite. Therefore I drove him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. And I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites each to his own service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. Again, intermarrying with paganism. Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gergeshites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jezebite, Je Jezebite, Jezusites, <laughs> Jebusites. Seven other nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them out over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. Now, at this time, God was saying, look it, go over there and kill them. Why? Because they were a serpent seed line. Offsprings, hybrids. You shall make no covenant with them, nor shall... Show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriage with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take your daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me. Look at this. To serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. Did God choose you or did you choose God? God chose you. The Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, which is known as the world or Egypt, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. 
And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will be, not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore you shall keep the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which I command you today to observe them. In other words, he will destroy all the serpent seed line eventually. Amen? But many people marry into it. In Jeremiah chapter 3. And the Bible says, know who you labor. Again, know who you marry. Amen. Amen. Most of the time it's lust at first sight, not love. Jeremiah chapter 3. You know, after being married with my wife for eight years and then divorced for three years, and then when the Lord decided to restore us, we needed a sign. She didn't want to marry an addict, because once an addict, always an addict, and I didn't want to marry anyone to interfere with my relationship with the Lord. So we prayed. And we prayed, and we prayed. And then the Lord gave us a sign that nobody could change. That only God could have known what to do to bring us a specific sign. So we knew to be married. You know, people are always looking for a love as a feeling. First of all, love is a choice. It's a choice. That's why so many divorces are happening because people lose the feeling. Then they go look for a feeling. The reason why they're lacking a feeling is because they're lacking relationship with God Almighty in the presence of God. Hollywood's got a real good example. I mean, you hear about all, oh, they got real good example of marriage. Fornication, then marriage, yeah, okay. And then divorce, and then fornication, then marriage, then divorce, then fornication, marriage, then divorce. Good example of how to go to hell. In fact, the word Hollywood is wood that witches used to use as a wand. So we know everything associated with Hollywood is demonic. It's demonically influenced. What it's trying to do is bring an, uh, 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 an image to mankind so that they won't grab the image of Christ. See, they want to set an identity on people. Many people lose their identity because of so much Hollywood. Amen? Hallelujah. In Jeremiah 3, in verse 6, would you read it with me? The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. Now, this is not a sexual thing, even though it could have ended up in that way. But what they were doing was worshiping other gods. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of what? Divorce. So God divorced Israel. He has divorced her even to this day. But there will be a reconciliation where he will remarry her. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. This is new age. 
They worship nature instead of creator. And we see it all over now. I mean, New Age is intense. It's everywhere. It's infiltrating even the body of Christ. We got a lot of believers that are bringing New Age stuff in. We got a Pope's assistant who's known as a bishop. I forgot his name. Anyways, he's got a logo that's New Age. He doesn't even know it, probably. But he's praying for unity. He's praying for unity. He's trying to get everybody, all Christians involved, to come around their back under in covenant with the Catholic Church. He, said, he says, it's not a, we, we can lay down our doctrine. No, you need to lay down your paganism. You need to lay down, stop praying to the dead. You need to stop kneeling to a man and kissing his hand and calling him majesty or most holy. That's paganism. And I, I don't, we shouldn't be joined with any of that. But many are. The Lutherans, uh, I don't know, all these other... Deceived organizations. Not all of them. But they're making covenant now to come back to the Catholicism. And this guy says he's in the spirit of Elijah. He's some bishop that's been under three popes. Been under them too long. Needs to get above them. He's deceived. You can see the one world religion beginning to form. Does everybody understand this? What does the Bible say? Don't, don't worship statutes. Don't pray to the dead. See, we're seeing, what they're trying to do is get those believers to break covenant. It's deceptive. Didn't we just read that the Lord said, go into the land and kill all of them, break all the altars and all, all of the uh, high places and, and all the statutes and everything? See, that's paganism. It's false worship. I remember as a kid, because I was brought up in Catholicism, the Bible says, call no man father. In other words, don't worship him as father. There's one father in heaven. Does everybody understand that? doesn't mean your, your father's not your father. In fact, I don't see the word I, 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 in the scriptures. I see what it says. It says that there are pastors, evangelists, um, apostles. Does everybody understand? Teachers. These are all, uh, all offices of the body of Christ. To equip and to teach. I didn't see one word of Pope. The word bishop means overseer. People are being deceived. What's trying to happen is the enemy is trying to break covenant with the marriage of the king of glory to a marriage to an organization. Does everybody understand that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Matthew 19. Remember marriage is covenant. But the first marriage you need to be married to is the Lord. Matthew 19 verse 3. The Pharisees also came to Jesus, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them are the, at the beginning made them male and what? Female. female. Male and female. Male and female. Marriage is not male and male and female and female. That's why this country's in trouble. We got an idiot as a president in all of his cohorts promoting all of this stuff. 
They had no idea. Call themselves Christians. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're promoting and they're trying to get individuals to break covenant with the king of glory. And they're succeeding in many areas. Many believers are so blinded they're following the man. They're calling him the Messiah. He's messed up. Not Messiah. And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man, what? Let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? He said, to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Hello. Praise God. Titus 1. Even his disciples had wisdom. <laughs> Marriage is not for everyone. Especially if you keep messing up. You must have just stopped. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Titus. Chapter 1 and verse 5. Let's speak it together. For this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking in appointed leaders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of 17 wives, oh, one wife. Hello. We got these religions where, yeah, I just believe you just marry one. Marry as many as you want. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's not what God, it says one wife. I don't know how you can handle two anyways. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> Sheesh. Marriage is full-time ministry, you know. You want full-time ministry? Get married. It's a wonderful ministry. But it better be solid. <laughs> but you better be dead. <laughs> You want to deny yourself? Get married. No. <laughs> Amen. Why? Because you give your life. She gives her life. And, but it's, like, it's the parallel of Christ. Being married to Jesus is full-time ministry. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife... Having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable. A lover what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who what? Contradict. Those who what? Contradict. So that person's got to be solid, isn't it? Does everybody get this? Solid. You know, there are many who have uh, lost families and lost all kinds of stuff because of the way their life has been. And they want the families right back right away. Well, you know, some of them are still dangerous. 
They may smell good, look good, but they're dangerous. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing. Your first marriage is to the Lord, and that's got to be maintained always. Always. If that marriage is not maintained, everything begins to crumble. Amen? Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 22. Is everybody there? Now, I'm not starting with this scripture for any reason except for this is where we have to begin. <laughs> Would you all read it with me, please? <laughs> Good and loud, okay? <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now listen, would the Lord be an abuser? Will the Lord be a liar? So wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But if your husband ain't acting like the Lord, you got no, you don't have to submit. Amen. Hello, does everybody get this? Amen. First of all, cast the devil out of him and ask him to go to his room and seek the Lord if he's an idiot. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the hot wife, as also what? Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. That doesn't mean that a husband controls the wife. Does everybody got it? It means he's there to be an example of Christ. Because there's submissions to both ends. If a husband isn't submitting to Christ, what right should the wife have to submit to him? A lot of those religious husbands ain't going to like this message. 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the what? word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, nor nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great, what? Mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. We are the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now let me share something with you. There's that area where a wife, how can a wife respect a husband who doesn't show respect to the Lord? Does everybody got it? That's called fear. Fear, reverence, honor, and respect to the Lord. If How can a wife, I'm talking about believer, how can a wife respect a husband that doesn't put God first in everything? Everything. How about, how can a Wife, respect a husband that doesn't pray. Correct his children. Back her up. Does everybody understand this? Of course, in reverse, how can a husband respect a wife that doesn't pray? That doesn't see that the Lord is first? Does everybody understand that? That's not consistent. Can you, can you respect someone that's not consistent? No. 
Let me tell you something. It's ridiculous of what's going on. People are losing the sight of being married to the Lord. They're walking away from God and getting married to the world. They're walking away from the Lord and getting married to the areas of thinking it's a soap opera. They got this goofy thing on TV now, L.A. Preach, preachers or whatever. It is perverted. It is paganism and it's disgusting. And it has no right to represent my father's bride. None whatsoever. Marriage is covenant. Again, first married to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Would you all read this together, please? Let's say this together, okay? Everybody ready? <laughs> <laughs> Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of your, their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, are you ready? Likewise, dwell with them with what? Understanding. Let me tell you something. The first thing you must understand is you are two different species. You are not going to think the way she thinks and she's not going to think the way you think. It is hoo-hoo opposite. <laughs> That's why he says, live with them with understanding. Understanding what? That you are not same thinking. Hello. <laughs> husbands likewise dwell with them with what? Understand. You know, sometimes we, us husbands, always want, when something goes on, oh, what, I got an answer for you. Sometimes they don't want your stinky answer. <laughs> they just want you to shut up and listen. Amen? Anyways, I ain't going to go over there. Okay. <laughs> Husband likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together, together, together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be what? Hindered. Let me tell you something, brothers. You better get understanding or your prayers will be hindered. Man, I'll never forget the first time I, I read that. I went, whoa. <laughs> okay, babe, whatever you want. <laughs> I'm with you. Lord, give me understanding. <laughs> Different species, help me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you gentlemen want your prayers hindered, You know what to do. Be nice to your wife. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> John 3. Boy, did it get hot in here. John chapter 3. Is everybody okay? In verse uh, 28, John is speaking and he says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. 
But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is what? Fulfilled. See, John the Baptist was saying that he was a friend of the bridegroom. He was the forerunner of the bridegroom. Why? Because Jesus was going to come eventually to marry the bride. But first, he was going to first birth the bride out of his side by hanging on the cross. Amen? Go to Joel chapter 2. Is everybody there? Joel 2, verse 10. Let's speak it together. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can endure it? Now therefore, says the Lord, Turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness. He, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. See, we are in the dressing room right now. All of this is dressing room. But eventually the bridegroom will come. And we will be joined, be released from the dressing. All your trials and tribulations is preparing you to stand before the Lord God Almighty. Your husband. The bridegroom. And Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus, with the violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. Babylon is associated with the world system, ruled by Satan, the serpent line, the sound of the harpets, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsmen of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. Why? Because we'll be gone. For your merchants were great the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all nations were deceived. That's what's happening right now. Because secularism is sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. In Revelation 19.6, and I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude, as the sound of many waters and the sound of the mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has been made herself ready. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine living linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
For he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you don't do that. I am your fellow servant and your brother who, who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes wars. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his, in his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's us. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he is on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and lords of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and all those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathering together, together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword who proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Who? That's the marriage and the sup marriage supper of the Lord. In Revelation 21. In verse 2. So this is where the Lord is going to marry the bride. But he's going to also remarry himself to Israel. And it says, Then I saw a new heaven, or ver, uh, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more seed. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And I want to turn to, I want to close at Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Is everybody okay? Praise God. Verse 1. And the kingdom of heaven shall be like in ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the what? Bridegroom. Bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Many people are slumbering and sleeping. They're not being filled. They're not obtaining that covenant, that relationship as bride and bridegroom, as husband and wife. That's why they're not staying filled with the oil, filled with his presence. See, his presence is what maintains relationship. So everybody got it. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. 
And while they went to buy, in other words, they went to go get things right now, they realized that they had lost respect of their spouses because they weren't abiding, they weren't consistent, they weren't maintaining their marriage with God Almighty. They became religious, compromised, and lazy, complacent. They began to be concerned more about their own life instead of an exchange of life. And they went out to try to fix it. And while they went out to buy, verse 10, the bridegroom came and those who were ready, those who were ready went in with him to the what? Wedding. And the door was shut. And after the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Nor the day, nor the hour. But I can tell you things are getting ready to happen quickly. And the Lord is saying, come back. Come back. Come back to the bridegroom. Come back, my bride. Come back. The word tells us that he will descend from heaven with a shout. And he will take his bride home. Don't miss it. Amen. It is associated with covenant. He is a covenant keeping God and we must maintain covenant with him. That covenant is maintained as you maintain your marriage. See when people go and they, they begin to worship other gods and begin to have idols and all kinds of that brings a certificate of divorce. That's why the lie of once saved, always saved is a lie. You break covenant with God, you're lost. He who willfully sins, willfully, willfully breaks covenant with the King of glory. That's where people are bound by the letter instead of the spirit. They can only get understanding through the letter and they don't even get understanding. The letter kills and the spirit brings life. Oh, they can quote scriptures. That's all they know how to do is back things up in the area of scripture, but with not understanding of revelation. Anybody can pick out a scripture to back up what they believe. But it'd be better be backed by the scripture, by the scripture, and by the scripture. That's the only way it is true, isn't it? Amen. Relationship. That's what Jesus came to bring. Relationship. Marriage. Covenant. No idols, no gods, only one. And when people get married, they better be careful because they can allow their spouse to become their God. Next thing you know, they're following everything and they're not in fellowship anymore. They're doing all kinds of other stuff and the Lord is not first. We must maintain a zealousness, a zeal for His presence and a zeal for the house of God. Maintain that marriage. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Let the sea be protected by the blood of the Lamb so that it grows and bears fruit for your glory. Bless your people. Open their eyes, ears, and heart. And open the doors of heaven. And let your presence continue to pour out on all of your people. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.